Thank you. Right, actually, um, I'm glad you mentioned Space Grant. I'm the uh, director of the Massachusetts Space Grant. Space Grant is an educational organization uh, run, uh, financed by NASA, but every state uh, runs their own programs. I noticed coming in, there was a list of some of the other activities going on in this building today, and one of them had to do with the Science Club for Girls, which is one of the organizations which Space Grant supports. So if there's anyone from Microsoft here, it'd be nice to make some contacts because it sounds like you're interested in supporting similar educational activities to what we do in Space Grant. But let me get on to the subject that we're talking about here today, which is uh, commercial space flight, and of course, commercial space flight in a sense that is making money by going into space has been going on for a long time. I mean, we have uh, television uh, repeater satellites, communication satellites, uh, you know, navigation satellites. Uh, the economy of the Earth would come to a grinding halt if all of the space hardware that we now have operating all of a sudden were to stop. Which, by the way, is not out of the question if we had a huge eruption from the sun like the Cardigan event back in the middle of the 19th century. But that's another, that's another topic. Um, assuming that we don't have uh, something like that destroying all of our, our space assets, uh, things are changing these days. And so the commercial activities that I'm going to be talking about are first of all some of the private companies that are getting involved in building space hardware that I'm sure all of you have heard of SpaceX and some of the other companies that are going on. But also, you know, thinking a little bit further ahead because people often ask me, how long is it going to be before, you know, the average person well, the average person, you're going to be about richer than the average person, I think. But before it's possible for private citizens to actually go into space. So some of you may be old enough to uh, think back when, when I was a kid, you could cut a little coupon out of the comic book and send it in and register for uh, Pan American's first flight to the moon. Well, Pan American isn't around anymore, and I never did get to the moon. But uh, I did manage to make five flights on this remarkable vehicle. I didn't want to hurt anybody's ears, but it's actually a lot louder than that when you hear it in person. I mean, the whole ground shakes. Uh, I was very fortunate, uh, as I say. My comic book didn't lead to anything, but I, I was selected as an astronaut. Uh, I was working here at MIT as an astronomer. It was back when NASA <clears throat> was getting ready to start flying what was then the brand new space shuttle. And whereas the earlier astronauts were mostly military test pilots, which was not something that I ever wanted to be. So I had never looked at being an astronaut as a realistic career goal. But when the shuttle came along and they had a crew of seven and you only needed two pilots, they opened up the astronaut selection to um, scientists, engineers, medical doctors. And then it did become a realistic career goal. So. As I said, I, I was very fortunate to make five flights on the space shuttle. Um, what are the chances that large numbers of other people will ever get to do things like that? Well, um, you know, it seems absolutely kind of crazy right now when you think of it, space tourism. But back in January, I was a tourist on a cruise ship down, we went down to Antarctica. And think about the implications of that. Um, you know, a, no, I'll, I'll do it. A century before, uh, Shackleton was, you know, that's basically where we were cruising around. And if you had asked Shackleton 
what were the chances, you know, back then that a hundred years in the future, hundreds of thousands of tourists would be visiting these waters? They'd have said you were out of your mind. And, you know, if you had asked um, uh, Amundsen or, or Scott or, or, you know, the people who actually went to the pole, if you had told them that someday there was going to be permanent scientific base at the South Pole, and that actually tourists would be able to, to visit there, again, they'd have said, you're out of your mind. You can't do it. And the reason you couldn't do it was because the transportation systems which were available just could not support the logistics that would make this sort of thing possible. And of course, from Antarctica's point of view, it, it was the uh, development of Arctic air transportation and Antarctic, you know, polar air transportation, which made all of these things possible and totally changed the whole uh, accessibility of the polar regions. So as I said, it's not going to be the shuttle uh, or a vehicle with this generation of technology that's going to make large-scale access to space possible. But just in retrospect, the shuttle did do some extraordinary things. It, it was not a totally successful vehicle. We all know it was not as robust as we would have liked it to have been. Um, but the two enduring legacies of the shuttle, when I look back, I think we would have to say are the Hubble Space Telescope, and that, that's me, one of the two people up at the top there. These are extraordinary moments I just have to, to mention when you think of what this means suspended between heaven and earth about 400 miles above the surface. Uh, things like this don't happen every day. So I was very fortunate to, and of course, they don't, NASA doesn't send us up just so we can have existential experiences. They, <laughs> they send us up to do useful work. And, and we did very useful work on Hubble. And of course, it's become uh, the great success that, that it now is. And the other legacy is the International Space Station, which really occupied almost all of the shuttle flights for the last decade of its operation, carrying up all of the pieces. I mean, it was about 40 shuttle flights involved in building the International Space Station. So, uh, actually, George W. Bush had announced way back in 2004 that as soon as the space shuttle was, uh, as soon as the space station was, was completed, that the shuttle would be retired. And sure enough, it was in 2007. You can visit the, 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 there's four remaining shuttles, three of which were actually in space, and then there's the Enterprise. And they're in various air and space museums around the country. And of course, we attempted to build a, the Constellation system, which would take American astronauts into space. That did not work out. It was canceled. And so at the moment, we are essentially paying the Russians uh, to take us up. Now, the Russians actually, when we talk about space tourism, they turned out to be very good capitalists. And they got into the space tourism <laughs> business before anybody else. It, it turns out they, their Soyuz capsules can take three people, and, and the Soyuz has a, a, a shelf life up on the station of a little over six months, so they have to have replacement change-out flights periodically, and you don't necessarily need three cosmonauts on a change-out flight, so they would have two cosmonauts, and, and in the empty seat, they would sell. Reportedly, the first one went for about $20 million, of course. Um, at the time, Russia's economic situation was pretty uh, dismal, and the entire budget of their space program that year was about $200 million equivalent. So that was the equivalent of about 10% of their entire budget. That would be like somebody coming to NASA and offering like a little under $2 billion for a ride into space. I don't know what NASA would do, but uh, just to put it in perspective, Actually, this is what NASA is doing with the Russians now. We, we have to launch our uh, astronauts together with the Russian cosmonauts from Kazakhstan on the Soyuz rockets. Of course, we're not getting rides for 20 million. They charge us about 80 million. Um, but then there's a lot more paperwork when NASA is involved. And there's also extra training involved. But, but it is expensive. And we're basically buying it from the Russian space company. There's obviously political implications. The back about two years ago, uh, when we were threatening all sorts of sanctions against Russia for the Crimea uh, affair, 
And uh, Prime Minister Rogozin said, well, maybe the U.S. astronauts are going to have to get up to the space station using a big trampoline. So the New Yorker <laughs> took off with that, and that was their take on, on the uh, current political situation. As it turns out, the Russians have been good partners. We, we, we may not agree with one another in terms of what's happening on the surface of the Earth, but I think it's kind of... Um, I think optimistic that at least in space, for the moment, we seem to be getting along together. But at the same time, we are paying the Russian space company to go uh, in space, but uh, one of the things that the Obama administration started was the idea that we should encourage and actually financially support the work that some private U.S. companies had already started doing in developing privately designed and privately operated rockets. And of course, the best known of those is probably SpaceX. Um, everybody knows about Elon Musk, made a lot of money selling PayPal, um, loved to launch model rockets as a kid, so he decided to build real rockets and make some money found out what many people have learned, that it is, in fact, rocket science. And it's not easy. And in fact, the Falcon 1 rocket, uh, the first three flights all had failures of one sort or another. And it wasn't until the fourth Falcon 1 launch that they had a completely successful mission. And Musk nearly went bankrupt in the, uh, in the interim. He luckily got some support from some of his Silicon Valley uh, friends and, and of course, now SpaceX is a, is a going concern. Uh, the Falcon 1 rocket was abandoned in favor of the much larger Falcon 9 rocket, whose main business is launching satellites, but they uh, also have a contract with NASA to carry cargo up to the International Space Station. So what is it that Musk and some of his uh, other private space entrepreneurs and developers have done that is changing the space business? Well, first of all, he's revolutionized how the rockets are built. Uh, if you ever get a chance to visit the SpaceX company out in uh, Southern California, it's astounding. Um, they turn these things out in quantity. I mean, they're, they're making... Uh, rocket engines like General Motors turns out Chevy engines, and uh, they make all, almost all their parts in-house. So he's, first of all, revolutionized the production process, which has allowed them to cut the cost by at least a half, to the point where not only were the Europeans, who with their Ariane rocket have really dominated commercial space launch over the last couple of decades, but even the Chinese were complaining that he must be doing something illegal. This is unfair competition. And when the Chinese are complaining about being undercut through unfair competition, you must be doing something right. But the other thing that, that he's trying to do is actually much more innovative. When you think about it, we are still flying Werner von Braun's rockets uh, in, in a very real sense. There's Werner von Braun himself with, uh, in Pinamunda. Yeah, I mean, our metallurgy is better. Uh, we have more powerful... Is this not working? Hmm. Um, the green light is on. Do we have another mic? Oh, wait a minute. That got somehow turned off. There we go. No, don't touch. Um, right, so, uh, thanks, Larry. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. But anyway, um, so, uh, yeah, we have better metallurgy. We have um, improved propellants. But basically, you launch a rocket and you throw it away and you never use it again. And of course, people have made the comparison. If you had to build a new airplane every time you wanted to fly from Boston to Los Angeles, transatlantic flight would be very, very expensive. So what Musk and some other people have been working on 
is the reusability of rockets. Now, of course, the space shuttle was designed to be reusable, but it was such a complex vehicle that the reusability ended up being a lot more complex and expensive than had originally been planned. So although the space shuttle was certainly uh, accomplished a, a tremendous number of different things, it never made space flight affordable in the sense that people had originally uh, hoped for. What Musk has done, they've done a lot of experiments uh, with what they call the grasshopper vehicle. The idea is to take the first stage of the rocket and after it has used up most of its propellant, instead of just dumping it in the ocean, fly it back to the launch site and land it. So they had a great many test flights and you can see there's no sound in this one, but um, you know they would go up a few hundred feet with the grasshopper and then they would hover and actually, you know, this is a very interesting control problem for, for those MIT people who studied that sort of thing. Just, you know, keeping something that strong, you know, it's like trying to balance a, a long rod on your finger. But he had a great many successes uh, landing like that. Um, tried to land on a couple of times on a barge in the ocean off the coast of Florida. Um, not quite so successful. This is one of those attempts. <laughs> anyway, uh, but he did he didn't give up and uh, he did have a successful recovery of one of the first stages on land and uh, so here it comes. Obviously, it's a little easier landing on the land because the, the land isn't rocking back and forth. But, you know, this is Flash Gordon sort of stuff. I used to watch the Flash Gordon rockets used to land like that, and, and, and we're really doing it now, so it's, it's pretty incredible. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, they, they do these tests of the first stage recovery as part of regular commercial launches, either launching a satellite or what their main business with NASA is, uh, together with Boeing, Bo both, Bo uh, excuse me, with Orbital Sciences and uh, SpaceX have a contract with NASA to deliver cargo to the International Space Station. And so they'll send up a capsule it will get into the vicinity of the space station. The space station's robotic arm will reach out, grab it, and then bring it in and berth it. And then they'll open up the, um, you can see this, this front uh, hatch up here. The interesting thing about uh, the SpaceX module, because they're, uh, I mean, the Europeans developed a cargo module, the Russians have a cargo module, the Japanese have a cargo module, Orbital Science has a cargo module. All of those modules take cargo up, you unload the cargo, you fill them up with trash, then you basically deorbit and they burn up in the atmosphere. SpaceX has actually developed a recoverable capsule. And this again is extraordinary because up until this point only governments had been able to do this. The US, the Russian, and the Chinese governments had developed space capsules which could survive re-entry and could be recovered on the ground. And here a US company has done that. And of course when you look at the shape of it, uh, it reminds you a little bit of a, of a human type capsule. And, and that's not by accident because what Musk really wants to do and is getting ready to do with the Dragon 2 is to take crews up. And uh, NASA has awarded a contract as soon as they have demonstrated adequately that they can do this safely, contracts both to SpaceX and to the Boeing company to take crews up to the International Space Station. So they'll fly up and basically uh, they'll go up and they'll dock and um, we will now have a privately developed and operated space capsule. Actually, it's interesting, uh, NASA had a, had a choice. They could operate this either in what they called a taxi mode where SpaceX would provide the 
pilots and NASA astronauts would ride as passengers, or they could do it in the rental car mode. Well, you can imagine that the NASA astronauts didn't like the idea of being passengers, and so NASA is actually going to just rent one of these, and they will operate it. But certainly, uh, for the initial flights, SpaceX will have their own astronauts flying these, and so the, the whole concept of private astronauts, something we haven't dealt with before, but uh, many of the companies that I'll be mentioning tonight, are they're, they're hiring uh, ex-NASA astronauts, and so they're, the, the whole profession is, is changing somewhat. And it's not just um, SpaceX and Boeing. Uh, Blue Origin, which I'll talk about a little bit later, is developing human spaceflight potential, and Sierra Nevada has developed a winged vehicle. Sierra Nevada didn't win the contract from NASA to take crews to the space station, but recently they, they were named as the third company that would be, uh, that would have a contract to take cargo up, which, which I think is great because I, I, I think it'll be uh, good to get another wing vehicle flying because that's a whole different type of space technology. So, you know, there's a huge, when you think about this, all the, these are all different vehicles. Mm -hmm. By having private development of space technology, we are getting a lot more innovation than we would have had if the only vehicles were being developed by designers at NASA just building one off for the government. So it's very exciting. Um, and I'll talk a little bit later about you know, some of the other things, non-governmental uses of these. But one of the things you have to remember, if you're going to take people, there are a whole lot of safety concerns that you have to deal with. One of which is, what happens if your rocket starts to go bad? And that can happen any time during the flight. You can have an explosion on the launch pad, that uh, happened to the Russians at one, one point, or you can have an explosion anywhere during your flight. So all sorts of tests have to be done with the escape system, which, by the way, the shuttle never had, one of the great failings of the shuttle system. But all future human space vehicles, at least for the foreseeable future, um, I suspect will have escape systems, and this is an example of, of the way you test them. So this is to simulate a... Uh, an emergency on the launch pad, and they have the SpaceX Dragon capsule. It's not sitting on top of a rocket, it's just sitting on the launch pad, but you, you get an idea of what will happen. So imagine yourself now as a space tourist. You've signed up, you've paid your money for the flight, you're sitting in your capsule, you're on top of the rocket, and all of a sudden, uh-oh, rocket's going to explode, eject, eject, and so here we go. Here's the test. Five, four, three. <laughs> So you're pulling over 10 G's at this point. Just for a very short time. After about a five and a half second burn, the trunk has detached. Dragon is tumbling as planned. The drogue chute has deployed as planned. Drogues look good. good. This is a pretty rough ride. Uh, On the other hand, it's better than the alternative when you think about it. Downrange distance. Meaning parachutes, all three have opened. And we have splashdown. All right, so as I say, it may not be an easy ride, but it's better than the alternative, and, and all of these systems have to be tested and verified before NASA is going to certify them for human uh, use. Now, another innovative thing that SpaceX has done, you have all that rocket propellant, which is used if you have an emergency, but if you don't have an emergency, now in the past they had those uh, tractor uh, towers on top and, and they would just get rid of them when, when they were partway into their launch and, and all that mass that you took with you is just wasted. The idea that SpaceX has is that they will use that propellant if you haven't used it for, for an emergency actually to make it possible to land these capsules without a parachute so you'll have a nice soft landing which as I say is um, a much more efficient way since you've gone to the trouble of carrying that propellant anyway, you might as well use it. 
Uh, it is rocket science. Some of you may have seen uh, the problems that SpaceX Four, had. Three, two. This was about a year ago. Sequence start and lift off of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket, adding to the International Space Station access for future American rockets. Of course, that's not the way it worked out. Has cleared the tower. Back shows the vehicle on course on track. And there was just one little strut piece of metal which broke at about two G's. It was supposed to be good for 10 G's, but it, it, it gave way and the whole oxygen system uh, ruptured and overpressurized the second stage and that led to the, uh, to the accident. But they recovered. Uh, similarly, uh, Orbital, uh, which launches their Antares rocket from Wallops Island, Virginia, using Russian engines. This was their latest flight. And that was particularly bad because it fell right back down on the launch pad and did many tens of millions of dollars worth of damage. Um, Orbital Science has paid for some of it. And okay, well, but the point is, uh, as I say, it's, it's rocket science and, and we do still have failures, but they're persevering. One of the amazing things that's going on, it's not just Elon Musk. There's a whole generation of billionaires out there who are space nuts and and you know whether it's these, this is the post Apollo generation or whatever but you know you have Paul Allen who's uh, backing the development of this straddle launch system I don't know if it's ultimately going to go to completion but it's an amazing concept the idea a little bit like Branson's Virgin Galactic which I'm going to talk about in a bit is you have these carrier aircraft which takes a full size rocket up into space. Each of these carrier vehicles is the size of the body of a 747, just to give you a sense of scale. So that's an amazing undertaking. You go up to about 50,000 feet, you fire your engines and you're into space. And they've also talking about using it for, uh, for taking people up there, for instance, on a, a Sierra Nevada type of, of a rocket. So uh, again, with a lot of these things, and, and I'll try not to say this too many times, but I don't know how all of this is going to turn out, okay? Invite me back in five years and, and I can give you the conclusion to a lot of these activities. Right now, there's a lot of investment going on. There's a lot of risks being taken and we'll just have to see. Some of them are going to work probably. Some of them are not going to work. It's unlikely that everybody's going to be successful, but I hope that at least some of them will be successful because as I said, it's, it, there, there's some game-changing stuff going on here. Uh, most of what's going on commercially is going on in the United States. Entrepreneurial um, culture, uh, availability of capital and so on. There is uh, an interesting development in the UK, the Skylon vehicle where they have actually developed some uh, a technology for hypersonic flight and the idea is that these engines, if if they can prove that they really work, could take off from a runway, operate as jet engines, subsonic, supersonic, hypersonic, and then eventually convert to pure rocket propulsion and finally fulfill the dream that rocket scientists have had ever since uh, the days of, of von Braun of, of a single stage to orbit. Again, whether or not they're going to be successful, but the uh, uh, European Space Agency and NASA engineers have taken a look at their propulsion technology and have said that at least it, it seems reasonable and, and worth investing in. And the European Space Agency, as well as the British government, now have actually started uh, giving them some support. So we'll see how that all works out. In terms of when are tourists going to actually get into space, it's probably first not going to be on these orbital vehicles. Um, it's more likely to come out of 
what's almost like we would call a second revolution in space flight. And here it's nice to give credit to one of our former students uh, at MIT and actually from the Man Vehicle Lab uh, where, where uh, I work. Uh, Peter Diamandis uh, got an MD. Um, I think he never finally did his PhD, right, Larry? But, uh, but in any case, um, he really wanted to be, fly in space, really wants to fly in space, but he looked at the statistics of astronaut selection and figured that his chances were close to zero if he went the NASA route. And so what could he do? Well, how about doing something to encourage the development of private access to space? And so he came up with the idea of the X Prize, raising $10 million. Um, after the first few million, uh, it was kind of he, he kind of ran into a wall, and then he was lucky enough to meet Anusha Ansari. Uh, a, um, she had come over from Iran as a teenager because she felt as an electronics engineer she didn't have a future, and she made a big success with, together with her brother with an electronics company, contributed uh, $3 million to bring them up to about $5 million, so it became known as the Ansari X Prize. Then he was stuck at five million, and he had the clever idea of going to Lloyd's of London. And he said, I want to take out an insurance policy that nobody will win our prize. If someone wins it, then you'll have to pay the five million dollars. If, if, uh, if they don't, then I don't know how much he was going to pay them for the policy. And of course, Lloyd's of London uh, went both to NASA and to the European Space Agency and said, is there really any chance? And the, the object was to, to build a vehicle completely privately, no, no government support, that would uh, be able to go into, into space that is at least 100 kilometers above the ground, uh, come down safely, and repeat it within two weeks. So Lloyds went to both NASA and the European Space Agency, said, is there any chance that somebody's actually going to do this? And of course, both NASA and ESA said, no, no way. They're never going to do it. So Lloyds wrote the policy. Um, and of course, this was um, th this whole idea of a prize w was nothing new in aerospace. I mean, Lindbergh uh, was competing for the Ortec Prize, spent about, from what I've been told, about $90,000 to win the $25,000 prize. <laughs> and, and all the competitors together spent over a quarter of a million dollars. That's the nice thing about having a prize is you get great leverage and you're guaranteed to back the winner. Um, because Lindbergh was a dark horse. You know, if you had been thinking, where, could I, where should I invest $25,000, you wouldn't have given it to Lindbergh. You would have given it to one of his competitors. But Lindbergh won and he got the prize and anyway, uh, well, NASA and ESA said it couldn't be done. Paul Allen, back again. Bert Rutan, scaled composites. And uh, I'm hoping that everybody here knows the story. They, they built it. The Spaceship One carried the, was carried up by the White Knight One to 50,000 feet. And darned if they didn't do it. Uh, they made their two flights. And actually, tremendous public interest. Uh, people sometimes ask, you know, why, are, why isn't anybody interested in space anymore? Well, you know, news is news. And, you know, yet another trip up to the International Space Station on a Russian rocket is not exactly news. But winning the X Prize was really news. There were 10,000 people out at Edwards Air Force Base when, when they won the X Prize. And so I think when some of these commercial activities really start getting going, it, I'm hoping that it will lead to a renaissance of, of public excitement about space. We'll have to see. But in any case, he won the X Prize, and uh, Spaceship One is now in its place of honor in the Air and Space Museum next to the Spirit of St. Louis. And of course, the X One, in which Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier. So a fitting end for that uh, part of history. The new era, you obviously recognize, I hope you recognize the gentleman on the right, which is Richard Branson, who decided there was money to be made here, and he invested in uh, Virgin Galactic. The idea was to build a larger version, uh, the White Knight 2, Spaceship 2, 
And about a, as of about a year ago, he thought that they were just about ready to start taking private citizens into space when, again, I'm sure you, you all heard about the tragic crash, uh, seems to have been due to a combination of pilot error and a less than completely safe design. Um, and so Branson announced that he was going to continue. Uh, it was tough, but he did. And just a couple of days ago, they had the rollout of the new uh, Spaceship Two, improved controls, more safety. Uh, and they're obviously going to start tests again. He's not made a commitment on when they'll be actually ready to fly paying customers, but uh, they've got hundreds of people who have paid uh, about a quarter of a million dollars apiece for a flight into space. And if you uh, have a desire to do this sort of thing, uh, after you put down your down payment, you'll actually make a trip to the NASTAR facility, which is a private space flight training facility outside Philadelphia. Notice how much of the stuff is private here. They've got a centrifuge, and they've put a lot of people through the entire acceleration profile that uh, you'll experience riding on the spaceship too, maximum of about six Gs when you do the pull up and you fire your rockets. And as you can see, most, uh, most people uh, survived it. it. There's some very interesting questions in terms of space. I, I, I shouldn't say survived. Most, I don't think anybody died, okay? But, uh, you know, they monitor your heart. You, you, you clearly don't want somebody with a really weak heart pulling six Gs. So, in any case, the, the point is that it will open up space flight to many people who don't have the uh, physiology of the average astronaut. And, and it's a very interesting question in the whole circles of space medicine is what should the criteria be for private space flight? Uh, you know, obviously uh, these flights are going to be expensive and for the most part people are somewhat older when they have amassed that amount of money. So you're going to have a much older population than traditional astronauts uh, with more medical problems. Of course, you're only, at this point, you're only going up for a few minutes at a time. We're not talking about going into orbit. So you can get away with a lot of things which might be more difficult if you were going into orbit. It'll be a great flight. Uh, you know, you'll, you'll be taken up to 50,000 feet. They'll drop you. So for a very short time, you'll be falling, and then they light the rocket engines, and you'll pull six Gs uh, until you get up to uh, about Mach three and a half, three and a half times the speed of sound, at which point you shut off the rocket engine, and then you have about five or six minutes of free fall as you go over the top of the parabola, and you'll be floating around inside. They've got lots of windows. You'll have a... Um, you're, you're going to be about 100 kilometers above the ground. Actually, the original uh, idea for the X Prize was you were going to have to go up 100 miles. And when they started running the numbers, they realized that re-entry from 100 miles, you were going to start getting into re-entry heating problems. And that might make it difficult for anybody to win the prize. And so uh, Peter and, and his colleagues running the X Prize changed it from 100 miles to 100 kilometers. And as Peter told me, hey, Americans don't understand kilometers anyway. As long as it's 100 something, it's OK. Um, I, I actually would recommend, if, if, if you're really going up for a view, there's other ways that you can get this, which I'll talk about in, in a moment. But uh, what you really want to do is enjoy your five or six minutes of weightlessness. And you can experience some of the things that, uh, that I did on, on my space flights where you know, you're in a, a new world up there. There is no up, there is no down. Um, and of course, you'll only be there for five or six minutes. So you almost surely won't develop the space sickness, which about two thirds of the people who are up there for a day or two experience some degree of. So it, it will be a, it's hard to say if it's a life changing experience, but it will certainly be an absolutely unique uh, experience of that. And then, of course, you'll have uh, a ride back down to the Earth, and uh, you'll be one of the only, well, at this point, there's about 550 people who have been in space, still a rather small number. And the hope of these companies is that that number is going to increase tremendously over the next decade. So, again, 
we'll have to see how it all works out. Uh, and Virgin Galactic isn't the only one. There's the x -Core company, uh, which is developing a, a new vehicle. Originally, they, they thought they could take a Learjet and just replace the jet engine with a rocket engine, but it turned out that structurally that, that was not on. So they've got uh, a new vehicle. Uh, they've developed their own rocket engine, and the idea is here you'll have a, a pilot and a passenger uh, sitting next to them, and they'll, they'll go up, and again, they'll make a zoom, take off from the runway, zoom up, do your parabola so you'll have your five or six minutes of weightlessness and a great view, and then come down and, and land on the runway, and they figured that they could operate this several times a day. So, uh, and they were offering it for only $100,000 a flight, although they've now raised their price, I think, to 125, so it's a bargain. Where are you going to launch all these things from? So this is another part of the whole privatization is there's people are trying to set up spaceports all over the country. Some of them conversion like the Kennedy Space Center. It's amazing what's going on there now, getting ready for private space flight. They are changing around a lot of their facilities. Um, there's actually, I, I read, there's a new spaceport. I, I need to change this. Georgia is now building a spaceport. I don't know who's supposed to launch from there, but everyone wants to get in, into the act. Wisconsin, Wyoming, uh, Alaska, so you name it. But uh, certainly the, uh, the most impressive, uh, completely new one is Spaceport America, which is right outside the White Sands uh, uh, area, Las Cruces, New Mexico. When I first saw the artist's conception of this, I thought to myself, no way, that's ridiculous. I mean, they're never going to build something like that. But they did. It's, it's a, uh, a public-private partnership. And uh, the only problem, unfortunately, um, Virgin Galactic was their anchor tenant. And of course, they, when, when Branson started the whole thing back in 2004, he said, you know, he thought it was going to be three, maybe four years before they started flying passengers and here we are in 2016 and he's still got you know a couple of years to go so there hasn't been a whole lot of business at Spaceport America and and they are having some financial difficulties but uh, hopefully eventually things will work and then as I said there's this whole generation of billionaires Jeff Bezos Amazon.com uh, he started Blue Origin. Basically, he, he doesn't have NASA contracts. He's, he's doing it himself. Uh, developed a new rocket engine. And uh, I'm going to now show you about a three-minute promotional video that Blue Origin made for their space tourism business. Uh, but it's not an art. Most of it is, is for real. Uh, and, and so let's run that. This part is obviously computer animation. This is the really cool part. Estimate 10 seconds until engine restart. 12,000 feet. 5,000 feet. Engine starting. We have thrust. 1,000 feet. LGS deploy. 50 feet. 7 feet per second. Touchdown. Engine stop. Yeah, who wants to go to space? 
I ask my students that and everybody raises their hand. Who wants to go to space? So, so there we are. I mean, incredible things are going on. Um, but if you just look at NASA's requirements for these vehicles, I mean, we're taking people up to the International Space Station, which we think will be in operation for another eight years or so. But there's six people up there. Half of them are have to be transported by Americans. They stay up for six months. So it's what, two flights a year? That's not enough to keep four companies in business like this. So if we're really talking about commercial space flight, you've got to have customers other than the US government, or certainly other than NASA. And so there are other things happening. There's another billionaire, Bob Bigelow, who made his money with uh, budget motels, and he wants to build a hotel in space. <laughs> um, actually, a space station, which it could be used by tourists. He also believes that uh, there are uh, governments of other countries which would love to send astronauts into space and uh, carry out scientific experiments, but they can't afford having a whole space program. Of course, the problem, uh, he's not going to launch this until SpaceX or Blue Origin develop the capability of actually sending people up into orbit. It's not like if, if you remember the movie Field of Dreams, you know, if you build it, they will come. Well, it's not that way here. He could build it, but they can't come yet. But the idea, hopefully, is that they will. He took this uh, technology, actually, from original uh, inflatable developments uh, that were done at NASA back in the uh, late 90s. And he actually has put two scale models. One of them is a 50% scale model, are up in orbit now. And, and they've been doing quite well. They've been up for, I think, six or seven years now. Um, so here he is, uh, you know, these are the modules, he's got his factory outside Las Vegas, and uh, they're ready to go. So again, um, this is, if you're going to go up and spend a longer time in space, this is where you may be headed, and again, lots of fun things to do up there. Uh, playing with liquids is always one of the uh, favorite you know, free time, pastimes of, of astronauts. You can do all sorts of neat things. If you go up there as a tourist, be sure to take lots of cameras. That's some of the uh, cameras that we had on one of my space shuttle missions, because you are going to see amazing things. I mean, you'll look out and you'll see cities. Uh, you'll see deserts. You'll see mountains, the Everest Massif here. Um, volcanoes erupting. Uh, glaciers, uh, storms. The Earth is an incredibly beautiful planet. Uh, when people ask me what was my favorite recreational activity when I was up in space, basically looking out the window. Never got tired of it. Even people in the space station will tell you they're up there for six months. <coughs> yeah, they have books and movies and things, but they never get tired of going up to the cupola and, and looking out and watching the Earth go by. Of course, you'll see some things that are a little bit scary. Uh, the impact that humans have had on our planet are now visible from a cosmic perspective. So some pictures I took flying over the Brazilian rainforest over the course of the 11 years of my space flights, you know, you see a road going through, and then they start having feeders go off from that, and then eventually uh, it's just complete deforestation. So there, there are some... Uh, scary things. Another thing that you'll, you'll come to uh, realize, you, you may have heard the expression, it's, it's rather poetic, and I've heard many people say it, even some of my fellow astronauts who should know better, that there are no boundaries when you're looking from space. Uh, as I say, it's a lovely idea, and it may have been true a few hundred years ago, but nowadays um, the impact of agriculture on different sides of the border all over the planet, you can see borders running, again, because of, of the impact that humans have had. So um, I think when astronauts come back from a space flight, often they have more of a, an eco ecological sensitivity uh, just because of being able to see uh, what's happening to our planet firsthand. But it is a beautiful planet, so I want to share with you a, a short video. It's about two minutes made. Uh, by astronauts 
on the space station. Uh, it's time lapse, so we're going to be moving around the Earth much, much, much faster than you really go. But it's, it's, there's a lot of beautiful scenes. I, I hope you enjoy it. So just sit back and imagine that you're floating weightless and you're just floating in front of the window watching the world go by and enjoy. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. So here's a space sunrise. the volcanoes that I was talking about. That's from inside the cupola. And seeing the earth at night is one of the most beautiful things because you see all the lights of the cities spread out. You can see the northern lights and this halo which surrounds the Earth at about an altitude of about 60 miles, glowing oxygen and nitrogen atoms. I'm sorry, the color on the projector is, is kind of distorted here. I don't know why that is. I... Here's, here's us. And one of the most beautiful things you can see from space is the lightning storms looked at from the top. It's the most incredible light show that I think I've ever seen. Denmark, southern Sweden. The Nile and the Nile Delta, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, Cyprus, Ireland and Great Britain and Western Europe. <coughs> and beautiful lightning storms. climb a mountain you can't stay on the summit forever and you can't stay in space forever so you do have to come down so you're going to be treated to a spectacular light show out the window of your spacecraft you know just like a motorboat leaves a wake when it moves through the water we enter the atmosphere at 25 times the speed of sound and leave an incredible trail of, of white hot plasma behind us uh, and this is all shimmering and, and uh, it's absolutely spectacular and uh, then you get on the ground and you're going to feel very, very heavy. That's the, when people ask, you know, what do you feel like when you first get down? That's the first thing. Uh, you're very heavy. Um, but our bodies remember what it's like to be at 1G and uh, eventually you recover and uh, 
you'll go back. Well, we're looking ahead, I don't know how far into the future for some of these things to happen, but there are a few opportunities if you want to get that view that I was talking about without maybe spending quite so much money, uh, there's two companies, one in Arizona and one in Barcelona, which are uh, just about getting ready to offer high altitude balloon flights. They'll take you up to about 100,000 feet where you really will get an astronaut's view of the world. Uh, you'll, you'll be up in the blackness of space. You'll see the thin blue line, which is our, our atmosphere. Uh, and you'll get to be up there for hours at a time rather than just the few minutes that you'll get in Virgin Galactic. Of course, you won't be weightless, uh, right? So if you really want to go weightless and can't quite afford a, a Virgin Galactic flight, uh, our friend Peter Diamandis actually founded the Zero-G Company, which makes private flights just like the NASA famous parabolic air, aircraft where uh, you know, you get to experience zero gravity for maybe 20, 25 seconds at a time, and they do it over and over and over again. When Peter first told me about his plans for this, it was back in 1993, and uh, one of my brothers is a real space nut, and he had always, the time when I was at NASA, he had always been bugging me to get him a ride on NASA's zero-G airplane, but you can't really do that with NASA. But when Peter told me he was going to have a commercial version, I said, this is great. In four years, uh, my brother's going to turn 50, and I'll get him a ride on this for his 50th birthday. Well, it took Peter 12 years to get FAA approval to do this, and so I got my brother a ride for his 60th birthday. <laughs> and uh, he said it was worth the wait. It's, it really is an extraordinary experience to, to actually just float. And uh, you push yourself off one wall, and you know, you're Superman, just flying from one wall to the other. It's great. If you have an opportunity and you're, you'd like to try that, it's a lot more affordable than Virgin Galactic. Um, and if you're wondering, do you, you know, physically, can you tolerate this, doing this sort of thing to your body? Uh, this is their most famous passenger, uh, Stephen Hawking, who, uh, as a, for, for a special, um, you know, celebration, uh, the idea originally, they were just going to do one parabola. They had, they had a whole crash team of doctors uh, along the side of the plane. Um, after the first parabola, Hawking said, I want more, you know, with his computer. So he did a second, I want more. And then Peter was starting to get worried, you know. So they finally, they got an agreement, all right, we'll do eight more parabolas, <laughs> and, and then you've got to come back to the ground. And, and, and Hawking said afterwards that it was the most extraordinary experience he had had his, in his life. I mean, you know, imagine to have been in a you know, wheelchair, unable to move and experience this sort of total freedom. So anyway, uh, I just want to end, uh, since I, I was, uh, as the title, as the future of human space flight, and NASA is talking someday of sending people to Mars. I'm not sure we're going to do it on NASA's schedule, given the current NASA budget. I don't, I don't want to get into that. <laughs> but um, you know, what does all this commercial activity mean for the future of, of human space exploration? So the thing is that traditionally, NASA has spent about a third of its entire budget just providing the infrastructure to launch people into space and take care of them once they get there. If and it's a big if, as I've been saying, but if that infrastructure can be created and supported by the private sector so that NASA could actually buy these services at the marginal cost rather than the total cost, it would save NASA a lot of money, and of course that money then could be used for space exploration, which is what I'd really like to see NASA be doing, not just running a taxi service back and forth to low Earth orbit. And so, um, you know, we've had incredible robotic explorations of, of Mars. Um, Curiosity is, is the latest. And the more we learn about Mars, I mean, the more fascinating a place it is. I mean, it, you know, learning about what we think was the early history of Mars, where we think Mars had an atmosphere and, and liquid water and, and possibly life. So Mars really deserves to be explored as well as is humanly possible, and that ultimately means going there ourselves. 
And what's happening is, is that in addition to the private spacecraft, NASA is developing the Orion spacecraft. Now, there's a lot of controversy about what NASA is doing, and I don't want to get into that now. They're developing a space launch system which will someday, uh, in an expanded version, have the capability of the old Saturn V rocket. Whether or not NASA can afford to operate this, as I say, is, it's another question I don't really want to go into. But I also want to mention that, um, that uh, Musk and SpaceX is also interested in building big rockets. Uh, after the Falcon 9, sometime later this year, he's going to be launching the Falcon Heavy, which will have a 54-ton capability. And on the drawing board, he's got these much bigger rockets, including the Falcon Double X, which again is going to be like the Saturn V. And Musk has said he wants to go to Mars. So maybe, you know, will SpaceX get there before NASA? Interesting. Uh, you know, they're, they're, if you look back in the history of exploration uh, of our planet, some exploration has been done, financed, and sponsored by governments, but others have been private. So, you know, who knows how it's all going to work out. Um, but I hope that at some point we will get people to Mars. And the one thing that we can say is uh, if you go to Mars, unless you somehow believe in this Mars One project, which I don't, again, want to spend much time on of sending people who will live the rest of their lives on Mars, but presumably you want to you come back home. And that is going to take a lot of rocket propellant for every kilogram of anything that you land on the surface of Mars, you need about 13 kilograms of propellant in Earth orbit just to get it to Mars and land it on the surface. And the cost of putting a kilogram into Earth orbit is thousands of dollars right now. And we're talking about, um, you know, tens of tons of propellant. So you can work out the numbers. Um, what we really need to do, and of course you need that in order to, to get back and, and get up to orbit where you're going to catch your ride home. So I'm just going to finish with uh, the experiment that I'm currently working on, which will go to Mars on the Mars 2020 rover. It's called MOXIE. Some of you may remember a drink by the same name that's not completely accidental, but the idea is that uh, we will ride to Mars, and, and the, the rover will be very similar to the Curiosity rover with the same uh, landing system. And then our experiment will, will ride inside the rover. Uh, that's a cutaway. And what we'll actually do is we'll take a big pump. You know, Mars has an atmosphere. It's very thin. It's only about 1% the thickness of the Earth atmosphere. But we'll compress it to about one atmosphere it's mostly carbon dioxide. And then we run it through an electrolysis system. Um, you all remember high school chemistry. You put two electrodes in a glass of water and apply electricity, and it turns into hydrogen and oxygen. You can do that with carbon dioxide. It's a lot more difficult, but you can do it. So we will actually split the oxygen out of the carbon dioxide using this electrolysis system. It is the very, very first time that we will ever have produced a useful product using local resources. It's called in situ resource utilization. It's only the very first step. It's you know a fraction of a percent of the scale that we would need for a human mission someday. But uh, you know Matt Damon had a, a whole bunch of them when he went to Mars, and uh, when we finally go there, we're going to need some of them too. We'll send our return rocket beforehand, and they'll have one of these electrolysis units, and it'll actually fill it up with the liquid oxygen that it needs for the trip home. And we may make some methane fuel as well. Again, that's another story. So uh, we've come to the end. And I, of course, am never going to get to Mars myself. It's nice to be able to send an experiment towards the end of my career. but. I have nothing to complain about. I had five fantastic space flights and have experienced uh, some wondrous things. And, uh, and I have the privilege of sharing my experience with very nice audiences like this. People ask me, do I ever get tired of talking about it? And the point is, when I talk about 
my space flights, it sort of brings it back. And so the answer is no, I never get tired. And that means that um, if you'd like to ask some questions, I'll be happy to keep talking for a little while at least. So thank you very much. Okay, uh, yes? Is space junk a problem for the low altitude? Spa trade? Space junk <laughs> is a big potential problem. Um, on three of my five shuttle flights, we had little dings in the windshield, um, and that's pretty typical. The space station actually has a bumper shield around it to protect against space debris up to about a little under an inch in diameter. Um, we can track debris up to about two inches in diameter, down to about two inches in diameter. Uh, and occasionally the station, and before that the shuttle, had to do evasive maneuvers. It's a real problem. Uh, everybody recognizes this. In a little bit, it's like the tragedy of the commons, though, because it's everybody's problem, so who's going to pay to clean it up? And right now, we don't have a solution. Nobody, nobody is actually, we, we have adopted some measures to prevent uh, more space debris, more or less, from, from being created. Although, you know, the Chinese <coughs> anti-satellite test back in 2007 didn't help. Um, but the stuff that's up there uh, does prevent a hazard. And if there are a few more collisions, you can get an exponential growth of space junk, which really in principle, could lead to a runaway which would make low Earth orbit unusable. So it's, it's a serious problem. Way in the back. Uh, yeah. Um, has NASA identified any way to protect against the hazard of cosmic rays? The question is, uh, do we have a way of protecting against cosmic rays? Uh, no, basically. Um, the, uh, of course, there's, there's two types of radiation. There's radiation from solar flares. Those tend to be lower energy protons, and if you have some, enough shielding, you can, you can go into a shielded area, uh, kind of a safe haven. But the actual galactic cosmic rays are much higher energy, and we can't really, you know, un unless you had, you know, a meter thick of lead around you, you can't really protect against it. And in fact, having just a little bit of shielding is worse than none at all because uh, the cosmic rays hit the atoms in the shielding and they break up and they spallate. And instead of one particle, you now have 10 particles. So uh, it's a question of how long you're exposed to it. And there's a lot of questions about, is a trip to Mars and back going to give you a serious, uh, uh, enough radiation to be seriously hazardous to your health or not, it's, it's, a, it's an open question. Right now, we can't protect against it. Yes? Uh, you stated that the International Space Station had about eight years left. Mm -hmm. uh, what is necessary to extend that, and would it be worth doing? OK, the question I, I said, the space station has eight years left. Um, Actually, uh, right now, the, uh, the, the original agreement was to operate it until 2020. And so we are already extending its life to 2024. I've been told by some Boeing people that they think that structurally, it probably has more life in it than that. Certainly, the Mir space station, uh, once we brought up some extra supplies, once we started flying the shuttle up there, uh, we turned a five-year lifetime into 15 years, but it was getting very old at the end. So there is a finite lifetime of the space station. Exactly when that would come, I don't know. But the thing is, it's expensive to maintain the space station. And given NASA's budget, at some point, they're going to have to choose, do we continue to operate the space station or do we invest that money in new exploration missions? And I think the decision ultimately will get made on Let's see what value is coming out of the space station in terms of scientific productivity. And of course, NASA has been looking for commercial users of the space station, but as of now, they're few and far between. So the agreement now is up through 2024. Probably a few years from now, they'll revisit that. Yes? What does your body feel like when you go to space? What does your body feel like? It feels very light. 
Um, the first thing you feel when you when the engines shut off and you become weightless, have you ever hung upside down? You never have hung upside down. Come on. Get get with the program. I thought there was something all kids like to hang upside. I, I did anyway. Probably most people here have. What do you feel? The blood rushes to your head, right, when you hang upside down. And that's exact that's the first feeling you have when you become weightless is, is, is it's like you're upside down, the blood rushes to your head. And, and in fact, there's a whole series of physiological changes which occur to the human body. I mean, I could talk for hours about that. Um, but in terms of the, the feeling, uh, the next thing after this, when you feel yourself floating up and you realize that just by pushing against the wall, you can go floating anywhere you want, all of a sudden, you'll feel a, a tremendous euphoria. A, a great feeling of, of happiness and joy just because it's such an incredible experience. At least I hope that's what you'll feel. You're, you're young enough, maybe you'll actually get to go and do it. I hope so. Yeah. What happened to going to the moon? Is what happened to going to the moon? Interesting question. Um, under the Bush space plan, Bush W, uh, we were going to go to the moon. Um, Obama canceled that and said, no, we're going to go to an asteroid instead. Uh, and then eventually Mars. Um, I, I don't want to get into politics. I, I think the Obama administration did a great thing with their attitude on commercial space flight. Uh, I don't agree with the decision not to go to the moon. Every other spacefaring nation in the world wants to go to the moon. Uh, and I think the U.S., we've done it. We know how to do it. We, we could put together an international lunar exploration initiative um, and, and it's something that we could do in the near future. Whereas when you talk about, oh yeah, we're gonna go to Mars in the 2030s or 2040s or whatever, that's far away. So I'd love to see us go back to the moon, but it, it was uh, a political decision that we were not gonna do it. And that's, uh, yeah. Is the time lapse video of the Earth Oh yeah, all these uh, I downloaded from, from YouTube. You can just go, there's, there's a bunch of videos that they've taken from the space station. Just, you know, Earth views from the space station. You can get some beautiful stuff. NASA's done a really good job, actually, of making a lot of this photography freely available, both from the space station, from the Hubble telescope, from, from all the NASA missions. You can download all of this stuff uh, freely from anywhere in the world. Can you tell us a bit about this picture? What were you doing? Oh, okay. Um, well, this is this is. Uh, it, it's hard to know which way to put that because you know this is the Earth, so maybe the picture should be that way, so that the Earth is is down. On the other hand, this is the shuttle, and this is the Hubble Space Telescope, so maybe it should be this way, so that the shuttle is down, and that's me. So, as I said, there's no up or down when you're when you're in space. I could show this picture any way I wanted to, but I'm standing on the end of the. This is the robotic arm. Okay, and that's how we do a lot of the work when we were servicing the telescope because the arm moves you around and, and you can carry big pieces of equipment and using the, the arm, uh, we, we were able to remove and install pieces of equipment which were much too big for us to have been able to carry around if we were just trying to move around hand over hand. Yes? Well, I saw a video where uh, this uh, one astronaut like over tool bag for a second, and it just kind of went off into space. That's bad form, yeah. <laughs> you lose, lose points for that. Yeah. More space yeah. You're actually supposed to have every, every tool we use, every tool bag was supposed to be tethered. And we practiced the, those tethering everything over and over when we practiced in the water tank. And sometimes people forget. I don't, I don't want to comment on you know, a fellow astronaut's performance, but you're not supposed to let your tools float away. That's for sure. <laughs> okay, no, I, I followed my tether protocol, yeah. What was the most important thing personally you took away from your experience with that? The most important thing I took away? Well, um, certainly as, I mean, in terms of a feeling of accomplishment, both as, an ast uh, as a former astronomer, which is what I was doing before I went to NASA, and then as an astronaut, you know, being able to, first of all, put my two hands on the Hubble Space Telescope up in space, and then actually to help fix it and, 
and you know that it's turned into the incredible success. That's you know if I had to name one thing that I that I really remember and and that was significant, that that would have to be it. Mm -hmm. um, so you talked about we talked about um, you talked about uh, the environmental impact that you saw from space, and um, a big human environmental impact is like trash in the ocean and plastic and all that. So what do you think about just shooting stuff off into space, <laughs> like away from orbit. Well, I don't think that sending human trash into space is economically well as a way of handling it when it costs thousands of dollars for every pound you want to send up to pretty expensive removal. So I think there's, we can figure out better things to do with our, with our trash on the ground. Mm -hmm. In all your flights and expeditions, was there one thing that you there's a million things I didn't get to do. I mean, I've never been to the moon, right? Uh, I've never flown over the poles, you know, the Arctic region. Um, you know, I could name a million things that I haven't done, but I don't worry about that because I did a lot of really cool things anyway. So there's a lot of things that I did get to do, which keep me happy. Yes? Um, you brought up Matt Damon in the Martian. Uh -huh. One of his skills was resourcefulness, and I wondered what your view is of the most important skill of an astronaut. Oh yeah, I mean, in selecting astronauts, I've been on selection panels, you want people who can fix things, who can use tools. Um, the partner in the very first spacewalk that I did on my first flight, his hobby was repairing old Jaguar automobiles. <laughs> great person to have as a partner on a spacewalk. Um, when we were, the first day when we were out working on the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, we opened the doors to get access to the gyroscopes, which we had to change out because four of them had failed. And then the doors wouldn't close, uh, which was very serious. We would have lost the telescope. So on the spot, we had to figure out what was the problem and how to use a, a, a normal tool in an unusual way to fix it. So yeah, ingenuity, problem solving is, is clearly one of the skills that we look for when we're selecting astronauts. Remember that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Does the moon look different from space? The moon doesn't look any different from space. No, not really. Um, stars, you don't see any more stars uh, from a, a dark shuttle than you would, say, on a mountaintop uh, observatory. The big difference for the stars are that they don't twinkle. Think about it. What makes them twinkle? It's the atmosphere, and you're above the atmosphere, so stars don't twinkle. Uh, the other thing that's unique looking at space at night, you saw the pictures, uh, there's this halo that goes around, which is the the oxygen and nitrogen atoms, which are excited by the ultraviolet radiation during the day, and then they emit the radiation at night, and so you have this, um, well, it's, it's like an, an aura, a halo, which surrounds the Earth, which is, it, it looks almost like a horizon, but you can see the stars go right behind it and then eventually set below it, and, and then also seeing the aurora is, is something from space, which is completely different from looking at it. <coughs> from the Earth. So yeah, there's a lot of things that are, are different, but the moon is not one of them. The sun is, yeah, I'll, we'll take one more question. The big, I don't, I don't have a picture of it now, but the, the biggest difference, I, I often like to show a picture of the sun in space, and then I ask the audience, all right, what's different about that? And the answer is, when you look at it, the sun is in a black sky. Think about it. You've, you've only seen the sun in a blue sky. But we see the stars at night in a black sky because there's not enough light to scatter off the atmosphere. But the sun, uh, no. Um, so we actually, you see the sun as a star. Uh, obviously, it's closer, so it's brighter and it's bigger. But you actually see it. So that, that's why you know, I, I often emphasize how different your perspective is when you're looking at, at the world from space. Very last question in, in the back. Ah, uh, a wonderful question, because I love space elevators. Yeah, the amount of fuel it takes to get into space, uh, 
you know, you measure your gas consumption in your car in miles per gallon. In a rocket, we, uh, we measure it in tons per second, okay? So that's, that's the kind of fuel expenditures we're using. Um, uh, the, the lady's referring to the concept of a space elevator. Um, it's, it's a concept which has been developed physically by quite a few, in, from a physics point of view, by quite a few people, originally developed by a Russian engineer. Arthur C. Clarke wrote a book about it called The Fountains of Paradise. Uh, the idea is, uh, I mean, in, and it sounds like science fiction, and at the moment it is, but you could, from a position on somewhere on the equator, you could actually run a cable all the way up to geostationary orbit and beyond. You need a, a balance. And um, that could then be the foundation, just like when you build a bridge. First you put one cable across and then a few more and eventually you end up with a big structure. So people have actually designed entire elevator structures which would go all the way up to geostationary orbit. Um, the problem right now is we don't have any material which has the tensile strength to be able to withstand the tension that, it, that would be caused by, by gravity. Um, on the other hand, carbon nanotubes potentially have that capability. We have not learned how to build massive structures out of carbon nanotubes like cables and things. Um, Arthur C. Clarke speculated, he, he wrote his book from uh, the point of view of about 300 years in the future. And from 300 years in the future, he looked back at the late 20th century and mentioned that back then scientists had first designed these little carbon structures. He, he called it solid, uh, you know, um, uh, diamond threads, basically. But it was carbon nanotubes. And that at the time they were, they were uh, you know, only microns in size and worth more than their weight in gold. And when I was down at Rice University, I visited Richard Smalley, who's a Nobel Prize winner for, for the uh, carbon um, um, buckyballs. Uh, and, and he was working on carbon nanotubes. He's, he's died a, a few years back. But uh, he was aware of Arthur Clarke's book. And he, he showed me in his lab they had and this was the late 20th century, just like Clark had predicted, they had these small carbon nanotubes that were, you know, tens of microns long, and sure enough, they were worth more their weight in gold. And, you know, Arthur Clark has a pretty good track record uh, of predicting the future, and he did say, if we finally develop someday the uh, space elevator, then humanity will truly have become a space-faring species, which I, I think is a very nice way to end the evening, because now we're really looking ahead to the future of human spaceflight. So once again, thanks for your attention. It's been fun. You never have enough MIT mugs. Never have enough MIT mugs. That's great. All right. Oh, great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Jim Jay. Thanks for inviting me.